For over a century, Jell-O has been a part of American culture, and according to a 1904 edition of the Ladies' Home Journal, America's favorite dessert. Conveniently enough, named such in an advertisement paid for by Jell-O before anyone was really buying it at all. Well, that said, ever since then, it really has been one of the most popular desserts in America. The story of this fruit-flavored, gelatin-based icon includes good old-fashioned American ingenuity, brilliant marketing, and a wobbly start. Gelatin, the main ingredient in Jell-O, has been an after-dinner delicacy for the wealthy, dating all the way back to at least the 15th century. The tasteless, odorless protein is made by extracting collagen found in connective animal tissues from boiled bones of animals, usually from cows and pigs. It was, and still is, a time-consuming task to make gelatin. During the Victorian age, gelatin was extracted by boiling cow or pig hooves in a giant kettle for several hours. Next, the liquid would be strained and the bones discarded. The liquid was then left out for a day, give or take, to settle. After skimming the fat off the top, flavoring was added, and voila, a gelatin dessert was born. By the early 19th century, the dessert wasn't just popular with well-to-do Europeans, but Americans as well. Thomas Jefferson was known to serve gelatin desserts at official banquets in his Monticello, Virginia home. In the mid-19th century, gelatin was so in demand that there was a need to make the creation of it easier. Who wanted to take time to boil cow hooves each time you wanted a gelatin mold at the dinner table? So, in 1845, the already famous inventor of the first American-built steam locomotive, the Tom Thumb, Peter Cooper, devised a way to make gelatin more accessible by making large sheets of it and grinding it into a powder. He applied for and was granted a patent, U.S. Patent 4084, for a gelatin dessert powder he called portable gelatin, requiring only the addition of hot water. Despite the future economic windfall the gelatin powder would provide, Cooper didn't market it, nor did much of anything with his invention. He sold the powder to cooks on occasion, but never commercialized it beyond that. In fact, he was more interested in the production of powdered glue. He never quite figured out that secret, though. Unlike Jell-O, as most kids find out early in life, glue does not taste very good. About 30 miles outside of Rochester, New York, in the small town of Leroy, lived the married couple of Pearl and May Waite. They ran a rather unsuccessful cough syrup and laxative business. After years of this and barely scraping by, they decided one day to branch out into something that they knew better food. May cooked all the time and loved to make desserts. So, according to the Chemical Heritage Foundation, after looking around for what to work on, they found and obtained the patent for powdered gelatin. Of course, the main drawback of gelatin is its lack of taste. They found a fix for that by combining it with something else they knew a fair bit about, making syrups. Thus, they added a significant amount of sugary fruit syrup using strawberry, raspberry, lemon, and orange for flavoring. Their product was now 88% sugar, but none of that mattered because now gelatin actually tasted good. May named her and her husband's new favorite dessert Jell-O, a combined version of the words gelatin and jelly, both of which derive from the Latin gelare, meaning to congeal or to freeze. As for the O part, around this time in America, it was simply a relatively popular trend to add O to the end of your product name, not unlike the fad of preceding certain names with I in more modern times. In addition, adding a letter allows a business to take a common word and easily modify it to make it easy to trademark. Another example from that time would be Grano, and in the modern times, of course, there's the iPhone. Unfortunately, while Pearl and May were good at making Jell-O, they lacked the capital and experience to market their product. On September 8, 1899, the couple sold the formula patent and the name Jell-O to their Leroy neighbor, orator Frank Woodward, owner of the Genesee Food Company, for $450, which is about $12,000 today. Already a successful packaged food businessman, Woodward knew how to sell a product. He dressed his salesmen in fancy suits and had them offer free samples to homemakers. They employed every trick in the book to get grocers to stock their shelves with boxes of Jell-O, still in the Waits' original flavors – strawberry, raspberry, lemon, and orange. Despite all of this, sales still sagged. At one point, a frustrated Woodward offered to sell the product line to another Leroy Townsman for a mere $35. Luckily for him, the person refused the offer. In 1904, everything changed. 
With the help of newly hired William E. Humblebore, Woodward decided to take some of the money he earned from the more successful products he made, including one that held a miraculous power to kill lice on hands, and he invested it into ads for Jell-O in the nationally syndicated Ladies' Home Journal. The ad, costing $336, featured a smiling, fashionably coiffed woman in white aprons proclaiming Jell-O Gelatin, America's favorite dessert. The ads were a roaring success, annual sales quickly jumped to $250,000 about $6.2 million today. Soon, beautiful hand-drawn pictures showing pantries stuffed to the brim with jello and kids begging for the delicious dessert were marketing the product everywhere. Woodward began printing recipe books, telling homemakers how to properly prepare their jello. They handed out free jello molds to immigrants arriving into Ellis Island. They introduced the Jello Girl, played by four-year-old Elizabeth King, the daughter of a brilliant ad artist, Franklin King, who Woodward was working for him. With a tea kettle in one hand and a packet of jello in the other, she declared to the world that you can't be a kid without it. Due to brilliant marketing, Jell-O became one of the most well-known brands in American history. In 1924, understanding the power of a name, the Genesee Pure Foods Company became, quite simply, the Jell-O Company. That same year, the company hired the soon-to-be-famous Norman Rockwell to draw a colorful illustration depicting Jell-O. He did just that, depicting a young girl serving Jell-O to her doll tea time. With radio rising in prominence, Jell-O became one of the first companies to advertise on the new medium, with Jack Benny singing to the whole world in 1934 their new jingle created by the agency Young and Rubicam, J-E-L-L-O. By the mid-1970s, formerly strong and steady sales of Jell-O, including their pudding line, began declining, so they hired the 37-year-old comedian Bill Cosby to be their spokesperson. It worked, and Cosby brought Jell-O to new heights. The Cosby-Jell-O relationship lasted for over 30 years and was, according to Mary Cross's book, A Century of American Icons, the longest-standing celebrity endorsement in American advertising history. Of course, nowadays, let's just say Jell-O isn't returning Cosby's phone calls. In 1964, the plant in Leroy New York closed when the conglomerate General Foods, now Kraft Foods, took over production. But Jell-O is still represented in that small town with the Jell-O Gallery, a museum dedicated to all things Jell-O. And now for some bonus facts. J-E-L-L-O, it's alive. Well, actually, technically, Jell-O is alive, at least according to a 1974 experiment performed by Dr. Adrian Upton. Dr. Upton attached an EEG electroencephalogram machine to a dome of lime green Jell-O. The Jell-O produced alpha waves much the same way an awake and alive human would produce. This experiment set the media a flutter, as they like to sensationalize everything then as now. But what Dr. Upton was really trying to prove is that an EEG should not be the only method used to determine if a human is alive or not. And we all know Jell-O isn't actually alive and never will attack us while we sleep at night. Except for you, Steve. It will absolutely attack you in the night. And now for another bonus fact. In 2001, Utah State Representative Leonard M. Blackham introduced State Resolution 5, resolution urging Jell-O recognition. This legislation declared that Jell-O brand gelatin be recognized as the favorite snack of Utah. It passed with only two dissenting votes, and Jell-O became the official Utah state snack food. The resolution was popular because Jell-O is well known to be a favorite among members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, otherwise known as the Mormons. Sales figures released by Kraft Foods in 2001 revealed that Salt Lake City, Utah, had the highest per capita jello consumption of anywhere else in the country. Due to this, the Mormon Corridor region in Utah has been given the nickname the Jell-O Belt. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do subscribe to this channel, smash that like button, and why not subscribe to our podcast? If you search Brain Food, one word, wherever you get your podcasts, you will find it. And as always, thank you for watching.